Four months have come and gone in a flash, and here are the JRPGs I played during that period in the order they were finished. But before we jump in, a word from today's sponsor, Garena, and their hit turn-based mobile title, Black Clover M Rise of the Wizard King. With top quality cutscenes rendered in Unreal Engine 4, an accessible turn-based battle approach and diverse challenging dungeons, players have been enthralled by this RPG, and it's only getting more intense since its worldwide launch last year. Season 6 has just begun, sporting a plethora of rewards, bonuses and added features for PvP like the host, ban and pick feature. In addition, Season 6 will introduce players to the captain of the Crimson Lion King's Merio Leona Vermilion, now available with enhanced drop rates for a limited time. But that's not all, you'll also get a chance at the Wizard King himself, as the limited SSR character Julius has an increased drop rate for this period. A boon to aid any player with his guaranteed stun and high levels of damage. Get them both and bolster your Magic Knight squad to brave the dangers that await. Scan the QR code or check out my link in the description to seize your chance to claim your own SSR Mario Leona and join the thrilling PvE and PvP battles today for free. A massive thank you to Garena and Black Clover M Rise of the Wizard King for sponsoring this segment and thank you for listening. And now back to the video. Initially, there was Atelier Rorona, the Alchemist of Arlen DX that I played on PC and it took me just over 24 hours to finish. Now, I did a full video on the entire Arlen Quartet recently, so in-depth commentary will be reserved for that. In this roundup, I'll shorten it down a bit, but you'll still get the idea. Was it the best Atelier I've ever played? No, but I think it has plenty of merits to bring to the table, and can also act as a great starting point for new players. It displays basically everything that a modern Atelier game is all about, a bit rough in places, but still enjoyable. Initially, it's got a very basic story. You take control of an Atelier that is at risk of closure due to a lack of customers, and you complete certain tasks as Rorona over the course of three years to prevent that occurring. As with many Atelier games, it's more about the journey than the end goal. The highlight of Rorona, at least from a narrative standpoint, is linked more to the abundance of fun and charming characters that make up the cast. Going on adventures with them, witnessing their unique stories and unlocking their specific endings, of which there's 14 in this game alone. The same ease of access is also there in regards to the alchemy and gathering. Rorona, along with her party, leaves the city and you make a choice to go to a particular zone which in itself will then be split into several mini areas, each with their own types of enemies and materials. Materials are easily gathered by just approaching the node and picking up, while enemies are fended off via the turn-based combat. Now when you get back to the Atelier, the crafting system will come down to whether you have sufficient materials to make the item. There is no grid layout akin to the Mysterious games here, rather the complexity of Verona's system all comes down to understanding how to apply traits and qualities to your finished items while simultaneously planning and balancing your actions with the limited time you have. Verona has three years to complete 12 tasks to end the game, and if she fails any of them, you get the bad ending. Nearly everything Rorona does takes time, travelling to gathering fields, making items, all of them will eat into that time limit. It sounds stressful, and I admit I thought it would be the deal breaker for me for the Ireland games, but that wasn't the case at all. I often would complete tasks with weeks to spare, purely through standard progression. So if the time limit is what worries you, I wouldn't let it influence your choice for Rorona at the very least. Like I said before, it's a bit rough in areas, but it's still a decent Atelier game and is worth picking up. The second game I played, no surprise, it was the second game in the Arlen trilogy, Atelier Tutori, The Adventurer of Arlen DX, also played on PC and it took me just over 40 hours to finish. Now while Rorona had its own charm, Tutori was my favourite game of the four Arlen titles, but I'd wager that won't be the case for others who try it out. Atelier Rorona has a fairly lenient time limit all said and done, but in Tutori that is not the case at all. In fact, I'd say Atelier Tutori is the hardest Atelier game I've played so far, and that's purely down to its time limit. Not only does travelling across the map and alchemy take up precious time, even gathering and combat do the same thing. It's surprisingly unforgiving in terms of unlocking certain events and meeting milestones that I had to restart the game twice. So while my playthrough shows 21 hours to complete the game, it actually took me 40 when considering the restarts and save load cycles. But that's not the only issue. Satori will feel like a massive step down convenience wise, there were so many quality of life aspects that were in Atelier Rorona that are not there in Satori, and that's because the DX version of Tutori is effectively the oldest game of the lot. While Atelier Rorona DX was based on its remake, which added a bunch of conveniences to bring it up to the modern standards of the time, Tutori DX did not get the same treatment, and it was simply a port of the Vita version with some added content. 
as such many of the player comforts afforded to Rorona were never carried over here, so it will feel like you're taking a step back in terms of quality of life. But if you can get past that issue and the time limit, I truly believe you will find the best game of the Ireland series, and even one of the best Atelier games of the lot. And that's because Atelier Tatori hits a sweet spot. It has that perfect mix of alchemy and exploration spawned through the game's main premise, which is the idea of being an adventurer. Tatori has an adventurer license, and gains license points through pretty much any action she does in the world. Not only do these points function as a way to renew her license, but when Tatori ranks up, more areas will open up for her, so the sense of progression is palpable. This of course opens up more character events, and also allows Tatori's journey to continue as she searches for her lost mother. A lot of the positives from Morona do remain, characters are still as good as before, the turn-based system has a similar template, and the alchemy is straightforward to pick up, at least on the surface. There are a few added mechanics here and there, but the makeup of the game is similar. The reason this game one-ups its predecessor is that for me, Tatori has a surprisingly great story. It's still character-focused, as many of these adventures are, mainly honed in on the growth of Tatori herself, but some of the developments during this game were well done, and Tatori was without question my favourite pro tag of the four when all was said and done. By all intents, Tatori should have been my least favourite of the Arlen Quartet, but such was its quality and core focus as an Atelier experience, it ended up being the standout among them all. And the third game I played was the last of the original Arlen trilogy in Atelier Meruru, The Apprentice of Arlen DX, played on PC and it took me 26 hours to complete. Common positives that carry over from the other two, similar turn-based combat for the most part, similar alchemy, and great characters, propped up more by the fact it's one of the later entries so a lot of the previous characters from other games return here. For all intents, that familiarity between the games may sound grating, I mean you're effectively playing the same game three times, right? Not at all. All of the games may have a similar foundation to them, but they all feel unique. Every single one will provide a fresh experience to a player despite being part of the same sub-series, and Meruru is no different. The gameplay loop for this game is sort of a mix between the previous two. You have a home base in the Kingdom of Arles, where you will conduct alchemy, see character events and hand in requests, but then you'll leave the kingdom and venture out to far off reaches in order to cultivate the land for the good of that kingdom, as Meruru has to prove she is a princess fit to rule. The main goal of this game is all tied to the development of the kingdom. As Meruru cultivates the land through alchemy as a medium, she earns development points, which are then used to construct new buildings that increase the population, and you can visibly see the payoff of this as the kingdom grows. The same holds true for the projects done outside the kingdom too, as Meridu will often have to bring particular items to the outskirts which allow the land to be developed further. These developments not only grant more development points integral for rank up, but also allow for better quality ingredients to be gathered too, as well as some specific ingredients not obtainable elsewhere, so there's always the incentive to do them. And thankfully, the time limit is once again lenient, in fact, the rest of the games either were quite forgiving or didn't have a time limit at all. The same holds true for quality of life features, they do return akin to Rorona, and that's because Meruru was the first game to start with the modernising of the Atelier format, so to speak, so what you see in Rorona is a byproduct of the template begun in Meruru. All in all, it was once again a great Atelier game, I'd say my second favourite of the four. Meruru stood out in certain ways, but still maintained the grounding and core focus of the Atelier series, and because of that approach, it couldn't really go wrong. It helps as well that it has some absolutely banging tunes, so once again, it's a recommendation from me. And the fourth game I played was, good guess, the fourth Arland game in Atelier La Lua, the Scion of Arland, played on PC and it took me around 36 hours to finish. Now I know what you're expecting, it has the same positives like the other three, right? Well, in some cases, yes, like the characters, especially La Lua, who is just a hilarious protagonist, a clown in many respects. But as for the combat and alchemy, we're talking about something that's 
pretty different in many respects. Lulua is pretty much a soft reset, a completely different approach. It came out a lot later than the others and thus had to adhere to the evolution and trajectory of the series up to that point. It still has that core focus of what an Atelier game is, but it's a bridge effectively. It had to connect the old to the new, and in many respects it does that really well. All the progression in the game is tied to the Alchemy Riddle, a paged Deus Ex Machina that Lelua uses to guide her through her alchemist journey. And it's all about finding clues to eventually discover new recipes, sort of similar to what was seen in the first Atelier Sophie. But players need not feel stressed when doing so, unlike the other games, this one has no time limit, and only has a day-night cycle as a substitute, so no worries there. Combat still uses a turn-based system, but has an approach similar to, say, Lydia and Suel. Lelua instead increases the party max to five instead of three, with three on the front line and two on the back. The three members on the front actively participate in battle, while the two on the back offer support. It's flashy, it's fun, and a representation of the gradual evolution of the Atelier series. A lot of modern features are also here too, like the ability to wholesale items, restocking them for a fee, and event markers for player convenience, so those coming from Riser, for example, and working back will find a lot of similarities. Alchemy, though, oh boy. They really upped it for this one. It got an overhaul, but they made it more complex than any of the games I've seen yet. It works well for the most part, a little finicky in areas with all the different menus and there are some helpful elements missing, like the ability to see traits as you synthesize, but it is without question the most involved crafting system of the four, especially when you consider the additional awakened effects that add a whole new element to the game. Getting the most of Lelua's system requires a good understanding of not only the traits and effect levels, but also those awakened effects too. And though I can't fault the ambition of its mechanic, it was a little bit too much for me personally. Granted, I was able to understand it enough that the late game bosses never presented too much of a problem to me, and I imagine there will be others who could break it far more than I was able to. There's certainly a lot of experimenting to be had here. But overall, Lelua was a solid ending to the Arland games. Not my favourite, mind you, but still a game I'd happily recommend to others, and maybe even more so as a good starting point to new players even with its position as the last of the sub-series. The fifth game I played was one that I had put off for ages. I had literally bought it over two years ago, and I can't believe it took me so long to get around to, because it is definitely going to be one of the best RPGs I play this year, irrespective of the new ones coming out in 2024. It's the third mainline game in Team Asano's Bravely series in Bravely Default 2, played on Switch, and it took me 42 hours to beat. It revolves around a group of heroes who embark on a journey to recover four powerful crystals scattered across the world of excellence, each representing one of the four elements, earth, wind, water, and fire. These crystals are essential for maintaining balance and harmony in the world, but they have been corrupted, leading to various calamities and disturbances. It's in the aftermath of one such calamity where our self-insert protag washes ashore, and soon after, he and three others set off on a journey to find the crystals and restore peace to the world. So first off, let's get the elephant out of the room. The premise sounds very similar to an early Final Fantasy game, and that's because the original Bravely Default and thereby the sequel was initially intended to be a Final Fantasy game, but Team Asano instead decided to make it its own franchise. What they ended with was Bravely Default, but there are so many resemblances to its mother series that it honestly feels like you're playing a Final Fantasy game in all but name. Four Crystals of Legend, four Warriors of Light, a job system, heck, you're even playing as Lalafels from Final Fantasy XIV. Is that a bad thing? Hell no. It feels like a love letter to those older titles, but given a modern twist and ideas of its own too, that is not a problem in my book. And for the record, this is the only Bravely Default title I've played. The original passed me by and I never got to Bravely Second either, though I managed to find it recently in my local game store. So this was my first exposure to the franchise as a whole, and wow was it a good first impression. As soon as I fired it up I was in love with the game, this is the kind of experience I look for when playing a JRPG. Right off the bat you get stuck into the combat that utilises this so called Brave system, which feels kind of similar to the burst mechanic used in Octopath Traveller. Every character starts at zero brave points, shown on the bottom right, but you can affect this before the battle starts by getting a preemptive attack in on the overmap or through other means. Now as for the battle itself, you have your typical abilities and attacks as options, but there are also two unique additions in the brave and default manoeuvres. If you default, you will defend yourself and also accrue one brave point in your stock to a max of three, and if you use the brave command, you will use one of your brave points and get an extra turn. 
so the idea is to build them up and then when the time is right, unleash them all for a heavy hitting blow. However, you can also choose to owe brave points as well, meaning your counter goes into the negatives. If you do this, you can say take out an enemy without preparing a stock of points, but the cost is that if you fail to finish the fight, your character will have to wait until that brave counter resets to zero. It's an intuitive and engaging system that rewards preparation, but what I love about it is that there's a high degree of risk and reward in the battle itself. Do you choose to take the chance and finish the fight off or play it safe and keep defaulting till the time is right? It goes without saying as well, but not only can the player engage in this system, enemies can do the same, and some of the bosses will have their own abilities that will manipulate their own brave points and the players too. How they affect them is purely down to the job they use. And this here is another highlight of Bravely Default 2. The job system is ludicrously fun and flexible, huge amounts of freedom that are given to the player even early on and it just keeps enriching further as the game goes on. There are 24 jobs in this game, three of which are optional, and every single one has their own strengths and weaknesses along with a job level tied to a host of skills. At first, the max you can get a job to is level 12, but you can eventually raise it to level 15 if you choose to do the optional content. Every character, in addition to your standard equipment management, can assign themselves both a main and sub job, with the main job providing specific passive abilities, and the sub job simply acting as an additional list of skills and battle, dependent on how many you've unlocked at that time. What's awesome about the job system is that there is so much experimentation to be had. Certain combos of jobs will perform well together and it became such a joy just to find the combinations that worked. And while that's fun, it's also equally as fun to break a game too, which I was more than happy to do in the early stages by maxing out my job levels and then using the freelancer job which basically gave a massive stat boost depending on how many jobs I had mastered, which was easy enough to do. Now I will concede that grinding is a thing in this game, but even that is fun because the game provides so many great ways to overcome it. This is not an RPG that just tells you to bash your head against single groups of enemies and gradually get stronger. You have a multitude of methods to approach it, like stacking encounters together, using items to increase the likelihood of facing multiple enemies at once, and thereby increasing your experience and job point reward come the end of the fight. You can then multiply this with certain passive abilities from the jobs themselves, and by the end, I had found a way to essentially break the game even more by instantly killing enemies before the fight even began. It meant that come the final boss, I was in the mid-90s with all my other jobs maxed out, so yeah, it became a joke. But that's fine, I've got no issue with a game that becomes easy because of the effort that I have put in. And in fairness, Bravely Default 2 is no slouch on the difficulty front. There are some tough fights in this game if you're keeping up to parity level and job-wise, I'd even say some of them are a bit cheap in the early stages. Even my freelancer method started to wane on the final chapter, thus forcing me to engage in a level grind to come the closing moments. But the fact that the option is there to make it easier if you really want to, awesome. That's the marker of a good game to me, one that gives a player plenty of options to beat it in the way they want. Now, as for when I did get around to beating it, I guess this is minor spoiler territory, if you will, so skip forward if you'd rather not know, but there are three main endings in this game. Only one of them is true, though, and is pretty much the happy conclusion. However, Team Asano didn't want to give you that ending for free, as it's by far the hardest to obtain, and actively requires you to see at least one of the other endings before you have a chance to see this one. All in all though, I'd say that final ending was 100% worth it, if not to see all the characters leave with a smile on their face. And I say that wholeheartedly because the characters are pretty good in this game. Well-defined story arcs, developments that fit in line with their motivations and personality, decent voice acting. Yeah, I had a good time with them and it helps that there's only four in the active party throughout, so it gives them plenty of time to develop their chemistry over the journey. I will concede that some of the wider members of the cast were a bit underwhelming overall, but even they had moments to shine. The story, well, it's definitely not inspired considering its familiar premise, but that doesn't mean it's not enjoyable. Bravely Default 2's story won't light up any narrative award gala for creativity, but it's presented well, and if anything that's all it really needed. It does what it needs to do to draw you into its world, and it's got some poignant developments for good measure. It won't challenge you on, say, an intellectual level in terms of questioning its deep themes, but it's a by-the-numbers fantasy narrative that will keep you engaged. Add on to that its wonderful art style, strong OST, especially in the latter stages, and an abundance of side content to get stuck into, and you've got a top-tier JRPG in so many respects. 
If there were any negatives, uh, I guess the dungeons were a little bit too long for my tastes, and the online features, while a great idea, didn't really have much impact in the game considering it released over three years ago, but they're minor, personal gripes of mine that I've no doubt won't even be seen as an issue for many other players. Once again, I am slapping myself with frustration that it took me this long to finally get around to Bravely Default 2, but better late than never. It's a fantastic game, excels in so many areas, and as I said at the beginning of this section, it's a shoe-in to be on my top 10 list come the end of 2024. The sixth game I played was voted for by my patrons as part of the retro series, and it was for Skies of Arcadia Legends in this case, that being the enhanced GameCube version. It took me just over 39 hours to complete, and it was indeed played via emulator. Now since I've done a fully dedicated video on this, I'll keep the commentary brief, and if you want the full retrospective slash review, you can check out the video I did around two months ago. Otherwise, let's get in on the brass tacks. Skies of Arcadia is one of the most well-regarded JRPGs ever made. It stands among the classics as a fond memory for older JRPG fans. And after playing it, I can certainly see why. Yes, I am of the opinion that it hasn't aged too well in certain areas. In particular, I feel its biggest weakness is in its overall slow nature. I don't mean in terms of story pacing of progression, I mean in how long animations and sequences take the play out from battles, to handing in moonfish, to ship fights, and also transitions between areas. I think that the random encounter rate is too high even on the GameCube version, which was noted as being curtailed from the original, and it also suffers from the pioneering days of the late 90s in regards to game development. This idea idea, where developers were trying to transition from 2D to 3D. And while Skies of Arcadia certainly embraces that aspect and does it really well overall, there is the odd frayed edge here and there in regards to, say, its camera which can become a nuisance in narrow hallways. So I'm not saying that the game is infallible, by modern standards it is lacking in certain respects. But even so, I still consider it a must-play for any JRPG fan, a game that should be at least tried because Skies of Arcadia does so many great things that still stand out even to this day. For instance, I'm a huge fan of its overall atmosphere and ambience. It certainly has the odd heavy-hitting moment, but the majority of the time you have that undeniable freedom of exploring the skies. Sure, in the early stages it is still fairly linear as you move from point to point, but you just can't match that liberating feeling of sailing through the clouds. It's something you don't get in many contemporaries, not right from the offset at least. And it only gets better as the game goes on, you get more mechanics to enrich the experience and start to do more things that fit in with the idea of being a pirate. Bounties, treasure hunting, discovering new lands, building a crew and more. I think the characters are great, they all develop well over the course of the game, there's nice chemistry between them, especially in regards to the core group of Vice, Iker and Fina, and I like the angle that the game takes with some of the antagonists. You certainly have the outright bad ones and the weasels who you wish the worst to, but you also have a lot of multi-layered characters, the ones who act against their own nature or have changed based on past experiences. Skies of Arcadia had a solid cast of characters overall, and they all contributed in some meaningful way to the plot, with poignant and relatable stories in many cases. In many ways, it's a game that embraces the feeling of the old school JRPG, but also bridges the gap to what JRPGs would eventually become in later years. It has that undeniable charm and carefree feeling to it, but also places a greater focus on presenting a narrative in line with the technology of the time, breaking the boundaries, so to speak, of what games could do. I'm sure for its time, Skies of Arcadia would have been a marvel, and even now it still holds up in many respects. Indeed, it's not flawless by modern standards, but for a game that released over two decades ago, it certainly did a lot right. Next up was one of the new releases this year in Grand Blue Fantasy Relink. I played it on PC and it took me 27 hours to finish. With its ever constant delays in the past, it felt like a fever dream that Relink finally saw the light of day this year. But as anticipation grew, it's fair to say it also garnered a fair amount of hype, and that was my biggest worry. With such a long wait behind it, would Grand Blue Fantasy Relink manage to live up to that? And I must admit, seeing the gameplay trailers had me more apprehensive as the combat, though it looked flashy, seemed to be a bit shallow at first glance. But unperturbed, I bought it and gave it a whirl myself, and it took about one hour for all my worries to dissipate. 
Grand Blue Fancy Relink was 100% worth the wait. It is an excellent action RPG, and I found it to be a game that catered to both types of player. Those being traditional RPG enjoyers like me, who aren't too in tune with the IP of Grand Blue Fantasy itself, and also those who are more interested in endgame offerings, which I imagine will be the more hardcore fans of the franchise or indeed those players looking for a challenge. Relink's story is super short, we're talking about 12 to 15 hours to complete it, and that's even if you do some of the optional side content too. However, it would be accurate to say that the main story is merely the beginning of what the game has to offer. After the credits roll, you enter a final chapter, and it's here where there is a little extra story to get stuck into, but it also functions as a sort of transition between the two modes, that being the story and the endgame. The aptly named Chapter Zero will pretty much give you an idea of what you're going to get involved in should you continue to play the game into the latter stages, while also wrapping a nice bow on the top of the story itself. I was happy enough to simply complete Chapter Zero and then call it a day, but what I'm saying is that, while the main story is short, the game offers far more beyond that that can easily take playthroughs well into the 100 hour territory. Now the story itself, it takes place in the Zega Grand Skydom, which is the setting of the latest adventure for the self-insert pro tag called The Captain by everyone else and their Skyfaring crew. It evidently takes place in the middle of the events surrounding Grand Blue Fantasy as previous events and histories from its universe are mentioned at certain points, and there are indeed archives to understand the stories of each of the characters along with the terminology used in the world. And with that connection, I dare say some people with no background on the universe will ask if this game will function as a good starting point. It is. It's fine. I've never played Grand Blue Fantasy and I was perfectly okay. The game does a great job in explaining all the concepts and terminology, the character backgrounds are explained clearly enough, and the story itself is very much standalone anyway, so there's no risk of getting lost here. And thank god it is accessible, because I can't imagine a world where I'm locked off from enjoying this game because of a lack of knowledge. Right off the bat, Relink has got to be one of the most beautiful looking RPGs I've ever played. It is a spectacle as much as it is a game. The vistas are gorgeous, the character models and sprite work is great, the animation is top tier, there is nary a blemish upon the canvas that makes up this game. The amount of polish is at obscene levels here and it results in so many well-presented moments throughout that main story. The cutscene direction and execution was top tier throughout, it never dipped, and it showed to me that at least on the surface, those Grand Blue Fantasy bucks earned from the source material were spent well. But to conclude that it's all style and no substance would be, I'd say completely off the mark. I haven't experienced a story that goes as hard as this in a long time. While it's nothing special in terms of premise, it's got brilliant pacing. It keeps hitting you with event after event after event, and every single one is at a high level which never drops during that main story offering. And I've no doubt that one reason why the narrative was so engaging was because of the boss battles. Easily some of the best I've ever seen. Models that take up the entire screen, multiple phases, high octane action throughout, you can see the influence of Platinum games at their best here. And while they didn't see the game through to release, as they stated their contract had come to an end before that point, leaving Psy Games or Saka to finish it up, their influence is clearly felt, and the game is all the better for it. It helps too that the OST is absolutely ripping it up during those sequences too. As for the combat itself, it's a tried and tested archetype for an action based game. Every character has a chain of attacks, a combo finisher, dodges, guards, a host of skills tied to them which you can change throughout as you unlock more, and of course a special move called a Skybound Art. It sounds easy to grasp, but there's a reason for that. Grand Blue Fantasy Relink has a simple foundation by design, because the depth of combat doesn't come in just one character, it comes in the massive variety of playable members you can use. At the start, you have a host of characters in the captain's crew that are involved in the main story events, and you can use any one you want up to a max of four in an active party. But later on, you can unlock more, and there are around 20 playable characters all said and done, each with their own unique play styles, despite having a similar foundation in their moveset. Some will excel in agility, others will have various stances to switch between and so on. Because of this approach, there will be a preference for everyone, and that becomes the cornerstone for the success of Relink's combat. It's kept fresh through variety, rather than through simply enriching a singular playstyle. On top of that, the combat also has effects like Link Time, which slows down enemies if you hit 100% on the gauge, and chained special moves to up the ante even more. 
There's more though, as every character has a notable level of depth too. Each crew member has a host of weapons that can be made and upgraded, sigils to equip which are basically the game's take on equipment management, a massive skill tree split into offense, defense, weapon mastery and overmastery, and also a story all their own for their time in the Zergogrand Skydom. You witness these stories through the Fate episodes, and though I like their addition and they also function as a stat boost on top of detailing a character's own story, I do think they are the weakest part of the game, as the episodes in many cases boil down to a still image with text and voiceover. Maybe they could have given us less of these and upped the quality a bit for what remained, you know, given us some more traditional presentation akin to the rest of the game's offerings to visualise these individual adventures, but they are serviceable. Even so, you will want to do these Fate episodes because they function as one of many ways to upgrade your character. Every member has a power level assigned to them based on their sigils, weapon level and so on and it acts as a marker to see if you're prepared for certain content. If you're below the power level you'll have a tougher time so the idea is to continually grow stronger to eventually move to the next tier. And this is the cornerstone of the late game offering. You gradually make your way through the lower tiers until you take on the more challenging content. You start at normal and then move to hard, very hard, extreme, maniac and lastly proud. This is where some players made the connection between Relink and say Monster Hunter, similar concept, similar design and still addicting to get stuck into for the right person. Like I say, I was happy to complete chapter 0 and move on as I don't get much enjoyment from grinding out content to later do the same content but on a higher difficulty, which normally amounts to higher damage and health pools without a change in mechanics, but the offering is always there if I ever want to jump back in. All in all though, Grand Blue Fantasy Relink is a massive success, one of the best action RPGs that will release this year. Psy Games and Co delivered despite all the development trouble, they were able to conceptualise and execute a game like this demonstrating they know what makes a great RPG. And though I personally will never play the browser game as it's never going to be my type of thing, if they do choose to make another game in the same vein as Relink, I will be one of the first to buy it. The 8th game I played was another from my 2024 backlog and it was for Nino Kuni 2 Revenant Kingdom played on PC and it took me 32 hours to finish. It begins with Roland who is the President of the United States, I'm assuming, driving to a city but said city gets nuked with Roland getting isekai to the other world. Here he meets the current king of Ding Dong Dell, Evan, with the city currently in the middle of a coup d'etat. With Roland's help, Evan is able to escape and the two of them work together to make a new kingdom while also uniting the world under a single banner. Now Nino Kuni 2 got eh, middling reception when it first released and I'll say immediately I think the game is decent. It's good. Not great like the first game but it's not the travesty that others make it out to be. That being said, it has too many ideas in there that just don't come together in any form of cohesive whole as if it's lacking some sort of identity. The core part of gameplay is split between a few areas. Initially you have the exploration which is similar in design to the first game. You embark on a journey across a mostly open world with treasure and optional areas aplenty scattered across it. Enemy sprites will appear on the map and touching them leads to an arena based fight. This is one thing that I think the sequel does better than the original. I much prefer the combat here even if it is a bit on the easy side. While the first game had the monster taming aspect that was very awkward to work with, this one goes for something that I consider to be Tails Light. It's a standard action based approach in a set arena. There are three characters you can switch between and they have melee attacks, ranged attacks, skill usage and can freely move around. It certainly feels more intuitive by design but the reason I coin it as Tails Light is because it doesn't come close to the combat offered in those games which have much cooler combos to pull off and better customization. I feel. That being said, Nino Kuni 2 does have its own unique take called the Higgledees, which are these rejected designs from other games given form. The Higgledees can join you in battle and offer certain benefits to the team like healing, buffs or supporting the attack. Like the characters, they can also level up, but not through standard experience points. Instead, they level up back at the Kingdom. Now the Kingdom is the big draw of Nino Kuni 2. Evan is the king of this land and as such he oversees the expansion of his kingdom to become a power all its own. He has the ability to build new facilities, enlist citizens to join and draw money and resources from the populace in order to expand it further. 
The kingdom building is without question the best part about the game for me. It's surprisingly in-depth even for someone like me who does enjoy strategic titles like Civilization and Total War in spurts. It's got all the foundation of those titles, but it has its own little twist to it to set itself apart, and incorporates it well into the fabric of a traditional JRPG experience. A lot of what you do in the kingdom ties directly into your journey, like the aforementioned Higgledies and levelling them up. Buildings will often have levels assigned to them, and higher levels allow you to research ever more powerful traits like experience bonuses, better armor vendors, and so on. In order to research these benefits though, you need the citizens, and they are found all around the world, often tied behind side content. Each citizen has certain values assigned to them based on where their expertise lies, and it's your job to place them at a node where you'll get the most value, whether that be for research purposes or to gather raw materials to make ever stronger items. There's loads to do concerning the kingdom, and that's a driving motif of the game overall. Level 5 wanted to ensure that the game had plenty of content for the players to get stuck into. And in many cases, that isn't a bad thing, but there is such a thing as quantity over quality. And I think Nino Kuni 2 embraces that a little too readily. There are a bunch of side quests to do here, yeah, I will admit that, but a bit too many in my opinion. You'll often find quest markers scattered around the towns in every new chapter, but having a lot to do is not an issue if it's engaging and demands your time. Unfortunately, what this game offers in terms of side quests is not engaging. They feel more akin to chores that you have to do for that shiny reward at the end. About 80% are fetch quests where a citizen will ask for a favour to go out, find this particular item and bring it back to them. The most annoying thing to me though is that you hand this item in and then they ask for another favour and then a third favour until they finally decide that you've done enough. They don't tell you everything they require at the first point of contact. No, you gotta go back to them several times till they've got everything they need. Let me remind you, Evan is meant to be a king, but by the end of these quests, he feels more like an unpaid errand boy. Like, screw you, Karen, it's your daughter. Find her the wedding dress yourself. These people aren't asking for favours, they're taking the piss. Some of them should be thrown in the dungeons for their disrespect. I get that Evan is meant to be a kind-hearted king, but there's a difference between helping someone out and being taken advantage of. Now, while the majority of these quests do suck, you do get some diversity here and there. One of them involves these skirmishes where you find a flag on the overmap and get involved in the game's final offering, which are army battles. Evan, along with four units of his choosing, fight out a scenario against an enemy army with the aim of routing them and winning the day. Sounds cool, but the way they go about it is a bit... meh. When I first saw the game, I thought these army battles were more akin to a total war. You choose your units, command them to go in separate areas, strategize around them, and all that jazz. Nah, it's nothing like that. It's more akin to a bump system from, say, Hydlide or early East games. The four units will surround Evan, and you simply just charge into the enemy units in these auto-scrolling battles. Evan does have certain mechanics that can aid in this though, there is something called Military Might, which is this counter on the top left. This allows him to replenish his depleted forces when they die, and can also be used for unit-specific special moves, along with rebuilding destroyed tactical structures like arrow turrets. He also has a Guts Gauge at the bottom right tied to a Charge and Focus ability, and then there's this Limit Break move that basically kills everything when the gauge is full. If it looks dull, that's because it is. I didn't like this at all. While I thought the idea sounded good on paper, the execution is severely lacking. And sadly, you do need to get involved in this for certain parts of the story, including a sequence for the final boss which is easier said than done when the dialogue text is not only ridiculously small, but disappears like it desperately needs to sit on the throne. That's what we refer to as a toilet in England. Why is the text in these sections so rapid? Did Level 5 mistake their players for speed readers? Like, yeah, it's a JRPG, so I'd like to think the audience enjoy reading, but we don't enjoy speedrunning it. How did they think this was okay? But what about that story? Is it any good? Eh, it's satisfactory, but it doesn't measure up to the first. My biggest disappointment with Nino Kuni 2 is that it doesn't really build on what the first game did. The original had a wondrous world, a unique offering all its own, and it stood out purely through its decent writing and stellar animation that worked in tandem with that. And despite being a more feel-good adventure, it had some heavy-hitting moments too. 
Revenant Kingdom, though, doesn't embrace that universe. It brings in certain elements of that story in Sprinkles, but it's mostly just this idea of uniting the world and nothing more than that. Heck, even the best part of the game, the beginning, is just forgotten until right near the end. The whole idea of jumping between worlds, which I thought was a great mechanic of the first game and could also be a boon in this story, not used at all. And it's not just the content of the story, it's the visuals as well. Nino Kuni 2 is still a beautiful game in many respects, but since Studio Ghibli weren't involved in collaboration for this title, there's a clear lack of that magic that was present in the first game. Towns, for example, don't have that identity anymore, and there are no longer any of those animated cutscenes which were such a charming part of the first game. Also, the actual cutscene direction is odd. Apparently the budget was higher for the sequel, but it certainly doesn't feel like that. The pre-rendered scenes, which do look quite nice, are often very short before they jump back to the standard text-based approach, and they only have the most minor of voice lines in between speech. I'll also say that I think the voiceovers themselves, I played with English ones this time due to the accents, are inconsistent in quality. Some are pretty good, like Roland, while others, like Evan, struggle at points. If that's what it takes, I have to try. And I can't stop trying until everyone is able to live happily ever after. So I... I can't let it all end here. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, the characters. They are nowhere near as charming as the first game. With the exception of Roland, I think every character in this game is a downgrade to what we saw in the original. Drippy is eons better than this star-bit-headed weirdo, Evan doesn't hold a candle to Oliver, Esther doesn't even need to try to be more engaging than the female lead here, they just don't come close, and I imagine one reason for that is due to the writing and structure of the story. Their development ends when their personal story arc ends, after that they're just there, in the background. The story in particular though, I was very close to dropping it come chapter 4. That chapter doesn't need to exist. It's pointless filler. It has no bearing on the ultimate goal and it encompasses everything that this game does poorly. The fetch quest mantra, the army battles, the lackluster cutscenes, all the worst things of this game are present at that point. Granted, I did push through though, and I do think it ends on a high, so there is that. You're probably listening and thinking that I hated this game, but the truth is, I didn't. I reiterate once again that I thought it was decent, but it's not at the level of the original. With some exceptions, like the combat, I just found that Revenant Kingdom fell short in many ways, which is a shame because it had the foundation there. All it had to do was build on it in some meaningful way. Even so, it's fine. It's a good game. Some people will find a lot to love with it, and it's not too long either. Get it on sale, you'll have a good time, maybe. The ninth game I played was a classic, and a fitting entry considering the recent passing of Akira Toriyama in Chrono Trigger played on PC and it took me 17 hours to finish. Again, full on video done for this one a couple of weeks back, everything I wanted to say about Chrono Trigger is in that video. But TLDR, I'm a person who prefers modern games, I have no connection to the games of old and even I say it's timeless. I was astounded at how well it held up. I said it there, and I'll say it here. If Chrono Trigger released in 2024 instead of 95, it would still be one of the best games to release this year. Such is its everlasting quality. Chrono Trigger isn't merely a great JRPG, rather, it is the definition of what a great JRPG is. It is the mould and the foundation that all other games follow to achieve a legacy of their own. It's been 30 years, and still, Chrono Trigger is one of the finest works ever made, ultimately encapsulating the definition of what makes a memorable JRPG and 30 years later, I am certain it will still hold that same legacy. The tenth game I played was yet another of 2024's releases and a highly anticipated one in Vanillaware's Unicorn Overlord played on Switch and it took me 52 hours to finish. Unicorn Overlord garnered quite a reputation before it even released. It was described as a modern revival of classic tactical games from the 90s and took around a decade to be fully realised, beginning development way back in 2014. The first showing given to players was via a demo prologue disc for Vanillaware's previous hit title, 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim, so it gives you an idea as to how long they've been working on it. The question here though is, was it worth the wait? Well for me, yes. Undoubtedly yes. While I don't have the likes of Ogre Battle or Final Fantasy Tactics to compare it to as a base, what I can say is that Unicorn Overlord is a fantastic tactical game that embraces everything I would expect from a game of its ilk, and if you're on the fence on getting it yourself, hopefully this will give you the push you need. 
Unicorn Overlord takes place on the continent of Feverith, where the land of Cornia is under threat by the machinations of former General Valmor. A young Prince Elaine flees to safety, while his mother, the Queen, stays behind to defend the country. The battle is lost though, and Valmor takes over all of Feverith, re-announcing himself as Galerius, the Emperor of Zenoira, an ancient civilization that he seeks to bring back to glory, and soon goes about conquering the rest of Feverith in short time. Ten years pass, and a grown-up Elaine, as the direct heir of the Cornian line, seeks to bring an army together called the Liberation to free the continent from Galerius's tyranny. That's it. The story goes like that as a high fantasy epic about retaking one's home, and it's as vanilla as it gets. The plot and offer here isn't going to blow anyone's mind, but it's still good, purely for the fact that everything that happens in the game is geared towards retaking the Cornian capital and overthrowing Galerius. There's never a loss of direction, and all the characters who join the journey have clear reasons for doing so. The opening 10 minutes forms the basis of the entire game, and it never loses sight of that, so even though it's basic as a premise, I think it's presented well, and it allows the game to endure in terms of that story. The world itself isn't lacking in lore either, there are tons of establishments, societies, groups, and ideologies throughout the land, and it's consistently updated in a dedicated archive that details all of the backgrounds and developments. Now, in order to bring together an army, Elaine has to travel around the continent and free the various lands from the clutches of Galerius, and this is done through two distinct modes. Initially, there's the exploration. You take control of Elaine and journey around Feverif to solve problems, find secrets and rebuild towns. It's massive and filled to the brim with side events to see and stories to complete, including several that are required to see the true ending. Some of the more challenging events are worth it as well, as they often give you some of the best equipment or even new characters to add to your army, so it's often rewarding you handsomely for your efforts. Yeah, some of the quests are a bit lame, as the templates are copy and pasted from one land to the next, you're effectively doing the same thing, for example, nearly all the areas have a quest where you chase chickens, a la Ocarina of Time, but there's a good deal of unique ones in there too, to keep it fresh. More often than not, though, a lot of the exploration is tailored to building or enhancing your army in some way, and is measured through a score and rank called Renown, which grows through the positive actions of Elaine. Forts will act as a method to recruit mercenaries, you can promote characters to more advanced classes in the latter stages, you can expand formation sizes, you can buy provisions and equipment in preparation, and the materials you gather on the overmap can be used to rebuild those towns. These endeavours give you honour points so that you can spend them on said army to further bolster your ranks. The journey will also introduce a host of characters to Elaine, and after helping or defeating them in battle, he can choose to recruit them to the cause, as long as some prerequisite tasks are completed first. In terms of depth, these characters are fine, I guess. Of course, with such a large cast, a lot of them have a defined arc to their motivation and why they fight for the liberation. Elaine meets them in some sort of battle, they introduce themselves and then they join. But once that's done, they don't really have much more to offer unless they're a lore-specific character. Outside of the core group of I'd say seven or so, a lot of them are just there for the ride, and the only real development you get is through the bonding events that you can unlock over the course of the game. You get these by building relations between different members, either through battles or by having them gather together for a feast at a tavern, which is definitely the most efficient way of going about it. Has to be said as well, the food looks damn good. Whoever did the nosh in this game clearly had an eye for food porn. I wanted to dive through my screen just for a tiny taste. That's a testament to Vanillaware as a whole, really. They're well known and regarded for their unique art style, and it's no difference in Unicorn Overlord. The game looks gorgeous, and the character designs are crisp and pleasing to the eye, along with decent animation to back it up. I will say I'm not too sold on the actual sprite art, as I feel it looks like something you'd see in an unrelated mobile game, but the core of the presentation is at a peak that only Vanillaware can achieve, so no worries there. It's quite clear that a lot of time, effort and money was put into the game, there's a good deal of polish throughout, but as the game went on, it did start to show fatigue. While the early lands like Cornia and Elheim are well realised with a huge amount of towns and events around the land, the later areas, especially Albion, felt barren in comparison. Smaller landmass, less towns and less side content, I felt that the game was clearly showing the lack of budget at the later stages. And that doesn't surprise me, because Vanillaware made it clear that by the end of development, Unicorn Overlord had actually run out of budget, and you can certainly see where those resources had to be 
stretched. Anyway, that's only the first part of the game. We haven't even touched on the true highlight of Unicorn Overlord, which is the gameplay. And this is where the game shines. Periodically, Elaine will be confronted with a battle, represented by this emblem on the map. Choosing to partake in the battle shifts the map to this tactical layout. The tactical system in Unicorn Overlord is in a league of its own. All battles take place in real time but can be paused whenever the player chooses. You deploy your units on the map and command them in the way you see fit. Tactical 101 there. But rather than having one member of a certain class fighting by themselves, you instead have several members joining together in a formation of up to five characters. These characters all have specific classes with their own benefits and detriments, and the idea is to make sure your formations are geared for whatever enemy you face while also making sure that the weaknesses of your units are cancelled out by the abilities of others. For example, cavalry units excel against ground-based infantry, but are weak against flying. However, those same flying units are weak against arrows, and so on. That flying unit, though, can be defended from arrows by the Vanguard, who has an ability specifically designed to block arrow fire. It's all about finding that synergy. Now, when you engage in a fight, you don't actually control the units, you just watch the fight play out. But the fun comes before that battle starts. You get a window as to how the fight will play out, with health bars representing the total HP of all units displayed before it starts. While I couldn't see a way to disengage, you can turn the fight in your favour in a number of ways if you initially seem to be losing. If another battalion is close by, you can switch out with them, or you can use items that will increase your defence or offence. Even changing the formation of your units before you fight can have an effect, like switching who fights on the front and the back line and who stands behind who. The biggest draw of the tactical gameplay, though, is in the player-made tactics system. Every character that joins a fight has a set number of active points and passive points, and they will use these based on a priority list set by the player. While default options will attempt to choose the best layout, and it does work well most of the time, far more importance is placed on the player tweaking the tactics to get the most out of their units, especially on the higher difficulties. And you could do the same thing with every single character. Not only that, there's a great deal of customization in terms of equipment, accessories that will give you more passive and active points, or even weapons and shields that have their own abilities. It is such a deep and fulfilling tactical approach, and it only gets better as the game goes on. The later areas bring all of the mechanics to the fore and expects the player to do the same thing. That's another thing I have to praise Unicorn Overlord for. The difficulty curve is on point. It starts quite simple in the land of Cornea, and even the second land too. But when you get to those later areas, it starts to ramp up the difficulty. But it's never insurmountable, as long as you're constantly tweaking and understanding the systems that are presented to you. If you're actually being tactical and strategic, you'll have a challenge, but you'll never be overwhelmed because of enemies that are, quote, too strong. But it's not all about the battles, even traversing the land itself can be a puzzle. Every formation has one leader who gives a benefit to that team on the map. Flying units can cross over walls, thieves can lower rest time, and berserkers deal more damage to obstructions. More often than not, you'll likely want to change your leader in the midst of battle to something else to get the most from their abilities, as archers or priests, for instance, can offer a long-range aerial volley or heal to groups that are fighting nearby. There are traps set across the map, watchtowers to increase visibility and increase assist range, ballistae to decimate enemy ranks. The characters even have their own abilities during traversal that can completely turn the tide of battle without even engaging in a fight, as long as you have the valor points to do so, represented by this gauge on the top left. There's just so much to work with, and it's easily the best part about the game. If tactical gameplay is what you prefer over a story, then Unicorn Overlord is the game for you. Heck, the story's still good. I'm a person who prefers narrative over gameplay and I still loved it, so you're covered in both areas. In short, the game is a triumph. It was well worth the wait. Vanillaware's aim was to create a tactical title that harkened back to the tactical games of old, while also offering a modern twist to set itself apart. Once again, I don't have those older titles to compare it to, but what I do know is that Unicorn Overlord will remain as one of the finest tactical games of 2024 and beyond as well. It embraces everything that a tactical game is at its core and excels at it, and also has that ever recognisable stamp of vanillaware to ensure it endures for the ages. A must-buy for any fan of tactical games.
The eleventh game I played was another that was on my backlog for 2024, and one that I got a kick up the rear to try out sooner rather than later after my time with Raincode last year. It's the original AI The Somnium Files played on PC and it took me 25 hours to finish. Not a JRPG, but once again a game that JRPG fans, especially those who are story focused, can enjoy. AI The Somnium Files is more akin to an interactive visual novel. It has multiple routes and narrative and character focus, and little in the way of actual gameplay. But that doesn't mean it should be overlooked. Set in the near future, it begins with the player-controlled character Date investigating a crime scene in an abandoned theme park. Date is part of a secret detective force that has the ability to sink into the minds, or somnium as it's called here, of witnesses and the like. When they can't speak through trauma, if they have memory loss, or if they simply don't want to speak, Date will instead sink into their somnium and try to unlock the secrets to aid in a case. His autonomous AI partner, Eyeball, or Iber, who takes the place of his left eye and is connected to his brain, aids him with his investigations, and they effectively work as a double team. This initial case starts a long-running narrative. Now as for the story, I don't want to say too much more because stories like this must be experienced as blind as possible. I was aware of how well it's regarded among those who have played it before, but it does not disappoint. It's got great pacing, poignant suspense, and it all comes together extremely well by the end. But if you want to know more about it, play it yourself and experience it firsthand. I won't be saying anything more. Now for gameplay, Somnium Files is very much by the numbers in regards to the visual novel format. You take a first-person view of Date, but in a twist to the formula, you can look around the environment to interact with certain items, from objects to people, and some of these interactions can lead to a number of optional events. In the case of people, Date can ask a number of questions as he gradually works his way to the ultimate truth. In many cases, these sequences eventually lead to the Somnium via the so-called sync machine back at home base. In these moments, players take control of Date's partner, Iber, and try to discover the clues within. At this point, it becomes more of a puzzle, as Iber has a total of six minutes to bypass a number of mental locks, with the clue normally hidden right at the end as a sort of repressed memory in the subconscious of the subject. Iber has to interact with the environment to progress, and basically every action takes up time. For example, kicking an item may take up 20 seconds. But to counter this, Somnium Files brings in the timey mechanic, which can change the amount of time taken to do an action. For instance, if you use a timey, that 20 seconds can be cut in half, and so on. But as you get into the later Somnium sections, you'll find that you'll need to plan around the timeys you have, saving them for certain events to ensure you don't go over time. And in some cases, you'll also get negative timeys, and these will increase the time it takes to do the action. And since you're forced to use them immediately, you'll need to eat that up on some inconsequential action that doesn't take much time before you carry on. It adds a little strategy and forethought to the mechanic, and I did enjoy these sequences for the most part. As visual novels do, it does have a fair amount of alternate routes too, and these are accessed via forks in the Somnium. So if you do a certain action in a different way, you can access these different routes, and it's only once you see all of them that you get the full picture. I'd say the only real negative that I had with AI The Somnium Files was tied to these branches. For instance, though the routes may be different, some of the dialogue does remain the same, but I couldn't see an option to visualise which parts I had already seen before. A tick mark next to the option would have helped there. The other minor issue is that you'll be forced to play through a Somnium from the start when attempting to go down another route, but I imagine that is required purely because of the time mechanic. That one's not too bad though, as you can quickly skip through to the section you need by holding down the right trigger over cutscenes. Other than that though, I like the mechanic of sinking into the minds of subjects. Every Somnium is a representation of the history of that individual, it's their memories given form, but in many cases are not a true representation of what actually happened. They can be distorted or exaggerated, and it's a very creative way of visualising those memories, while also getting a window into the complexities and depth of each of the characters. And the character palette as a whole does not disappoint. Each of them has a moment in the spotlight in their own separate route, and they all have layers of depth and development relevant to the story as a whole. I wouldn't say I liked all of them, but that's just good writing. And while I can wax lyrical about the package as a whole, the best representation of the strength of these characters and indeed their writing is shown by Date himself. Date is such a great protagonist, he's the ultimate dork in many ways. He has awesome moments within him, but he's more like a Kazuma slash Gintsuki crossover than anything else, a guy who knows when to get serious, but also a character who knows when to let loose a bit. Ah, no. Eh, 
っと私は警視庁の伊達というものですがバカかお前は切られただろうなしょっぱなから警視庁を名乗るバカがどこにいるだってしょうがないだろ心の準備ができてなかったんだお前がかけろって言ったんだぞそうだがあきれた In short, I love the humor in this game. There are plenty of sequences and jokes that are right up my alley, and I feel that Date is the reason as to why so much of it succeeds. It's not just him as well, Iber is equally as good, and they bounce off each other as a decent double act. I don't really have anything bad to say about these characters as a whole. They're all animated well, they have layers of personality and motives that prop up their actions. It's just one of the game's best points, if not the best. And they'll keep you entertained for what is a fairly short game all said and done. Like I said, it took me around 25 hours to complete, and I was pretty much exploring everything in the vicinity in between story sections, so I've no doubt some people could finish it faster. But I'll leave it there, out of fear of potentially spoiling anything if you choose to try it yourself. All I'll say is that if you're a fan of stories like I am, give Fort Trying AI the Somnium Files. It's another hit experience from Spike Chunsoft. As is the final entry, the 12th one, and out of fear of spoiling, I'm going to keep this entry short because it's essentially the same game in AI The Somnium Files Nirvana Initiative, played on PC, and it once again took me around 25 hours to finish. It is a direct sequel to the first, and as such carries over many of the same mechanics. Progression of the story is similar, interactions and dialogue utilise the same approach, and so on. Even so, Nirvana Initiative does have a couple of things to freshen it up. There are AI recreation sequences where you effectively retrace the steps of the culprit to better visualise what occurred, and I'd say that the puzzles and somniums in this game were notably more complex than the first. The somniums in particular were very creative for Nirvana Initiative, and they already had a strong base from the first game, but I'd say overall, I preferred these ones in terms of what they brought to the table. And as for the puzzles, well... There were a few moments where I found myself completely stumped. One moment in particular required clues from specific parts of two routes to even progress to the second portion of the game. And even though the summary told me where it was, it didn't actually state what it was, so I found myself revisiting certain sections to find what I needed. If anything, that's the one issue I had with Nirvana Initiative. There were some areas where it does feel player hostile. Even with the clues given, some of them are so specific that it can still be difficult to decipher, and even then, I couldn't find an option to reopen the archive so I could remind myself. That feature would have been helpful at points. There was also another issue, though, that was mostly related to the performance of the game itself, or at least what I saw in the PC version. There were weird input errors at points where I wasn't able to navigate the menu, and the cursor would stay on screen during cutscenes, which did take a bit from the immersion. Two issues that the first one didn't have. Otherwise, though, it's still a fantastic story-based game. I'd say I slightly preferred the original, but Nirvana Initiative isn't far behind. Should we apply a number to it? If the original AI is a 9 out of 10, then Nirvana Initiative is an 8.8. .8. It's got plenty of the thought-provoking themes covered, the additions to the cast are deep and enjoyable, and the story certainly doesn't disappoint. It's as much of a head-twister as the first. And I'm happy that I played them both, as it looks like director Akira Okado and Spike Chunsoft are teasing a third game for the series, so when that gets announced, I'll be all over it. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, please like and subscribe for more JRPG content and consider joining my Patreon if you're interested. Peace.